thank you so much, Colin, for joining us today. I am so excited to hear about Gravitics. We actually had this as a requested topic because people in our community wanted to know about commercial space stations. In particular, Gravitics was mentioned as one that was a top of wanting to learn about, especially since our community is looking forward to the day when we can go to these commercial space stations ourselves. You know, all of us want to either some way or another get off Earth, whether it's suborbital, orbital, or beyond. And so really looking forward to hearing more about Gravitics. Um, but first, I want to hear more about you, Colin. So please tell us about yourself. Yeah, so uh, my name's Colin Dawn, CEO of Gravitics, co-founder there. Uh, my background um, kind of uh, bifurcated. I have a 20-year career with Lockheed Martin. was able to work on some amazing projects, modernizing the launch range at Vandenberg, uh, doing some um, Earth imaging constellation projects for the U.S. Air Force and U.S. Uh, Space Force, incredible career, love those humans, love the mission uh, that they're about. Uh, you can probably see some posters still behind me of, of my fondness towards them. Um, additionally, uh, then at the complete other end of the spectrum, co-founded uh, Altius Space Machines. Um, Altius um, builds uh, a lot of capture devices for uh, debris removal for satellites and trying to be responsible in space. In fact, uh, this uh, black guy right here, this little tag, um, is a, a dog tag and we're on, I think, all but maybe 50 of the OneWeb fleet. So we are on over 500 satellites in orbit. So I'm very proud of that. And we were the first uh, purchase uh, that uh, Voyager Space uh, made back in 2019. So sold the uh, company then. So um, very different experiences, uh, very high process on the uh, Lockheed side, had to be right, had to be perfect the first time, had a huge army to make it so, and the, the scrappy garage startup that is Altius, uh, where system engineering was also often a uh, documentation exercise on the, on the back end, um, but moving very quickly. And um, I think Gravitics probably tries to uh, carve a path in between those two extremes. That is fascinating. Your jobs all have in common space and engineering, but they are all quite different. Satellites, space stations, um, Lockheed Martin. So what is it that brought you into the space industry to begin with? And how did those jobs connect one to another? Mm, interesting. Um, I've loved space since I was a little kid. My mom says at six years old, I said, I'm going to work for an astronaut company. <laughs> and so I think I've uh, shaved the head and drunk the Kool-Aid from a very early age. I think the part that uh, has um, changed over my career is I, being less and less satisfied with a, a pretend future that can be fulfilled with a, a computer game that lets me conquer the galaxy um, or, or the sci-fi television show that's set 300 years in the future or a thousand. Um, I, I want the real, I, I want to go make this so that, you know, as you were mentioning in the intro, that we can go, that my daughter can actually visit space in a way that um, I'm saying, yes, darling, you go. This will be amazing. Um, we, we can do that in our lifetimes, but it requires a level of um, reality that isn't always fun for the dreamer part of me that wants that Star Trek future um, to be grounded in the here and now. Um, okay, so what's the concrete step I can take forward that actually can make that real and, and not get too lost in, in the potential dreams of a generation in the future? And so that concrete step that you wanted to take that was founding your own company, Gravitics, and really making that happen? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what Gravitics is focused on is saying, we're looking at really hard problems that uh, need to get solved for humanity to really kind of claim the sky. And one of those problems, which is our initial focus, is large real estate plays basically in space, space spaces that are safe for humanity to take their first steps in um, that cis lunar space and eventually throughout the solar system. And the second, which is maybe the namesake of the company, is a spin gravity future that we have to look forward to. You know, with, without gravity in some element as a part of the way that we live in space for long time, uh, long duration stays, we're, we're stuck kind of a year or less. You know, there's just so many problems with microgravity. Um, you know, we've got issues with anemia in the blood, bone loss at about 1% per month, even with exercise. Um, uh, heart shrinkage we found with some of the long duration stays of astronauts most recently. There's some very scary stuff that comes with staying in space for a long time. And there's some incredible opportunities with the way that microgravity works for product development. 
And so we're going to need a yes and kind of a future, but we absolutely are going to have to solve gravity. And with it, we really can extend human flourishing through the solar system. But without it, we're going to be short term visitors into a foreign space. And, and, and I don't want um, uh, outer space to be foreign to us. So eventually gravity gets solved. Initially, let's create some really large spaces that are easy um, and affordable to access. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I see space as our home. And so it, it may seem foreign to most of us because we've not been there, but we are still part of space. We are in space and we don't think of it that way. But I want to return to the artificial gravity concept in a little bit. But first, I want to know about StarMax and, and your first uh, prototypes and how they're going. Yeah, that's excellent. So the best way to think about StarMax is, yes, it's a large pressurized space. You can put anything you want inside there, whether that's humans and we're packing it out to create a space hotel uh, or whether that is some type of laboratory and we're trying to like tip the, the needle from pre-commercialization to commercialization. The ISS is very much at the vanguard of that pre-commercialization part um, or whether we're past that hump and we're actually ready for some type of fabrication space. You know, we joke Habs, Labs and Fabs as what, kind of what the, makes the a Star Max primary Star Max ways to kind of break out through the pressure use of Star Max. But also we have the thrusters, we have the uh, wrapped uh, solar panels to give you about seven to 10 kilowatts of orbit average power uh, and enough smarts on board um, with computer hardware and software to be able to leave one of the advanced um, launch vehicles that make all this possible. So think Starship, New, Glenn, or Vulcan, and be able to find your space station in the dark of space and to be able to fly up to Laura Station and be able to attach ourselves there um, and scale out your station over time for whatever your needs are at the moment. Well, I thought I dreamed big, but I never thought to name a space station after me. So. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah, we'll have Colin Space Station someday. I'm sure it'll hold uh, my No way, no way. I don't want to name that. Where does the name StarMax come from? Well, we were originally saying, what's the largest thing we could put up there? And at least from a diameter perspective, Starship was that largest thing at eight meters. I mean, that's twice the width of the ISS uh, modules today. Um, so what if we maxed out a Starship? And so the name really kind of flows from that. And it really was a challenge to ourselves. It said, if we don't build them capable of build being that big, somebody else will. And so um, we're definitely claiming um, a flexibility of going as large as you want. But, you know, large is interesting. If we went with a stretch Vulcan, although I'd have to shrink you from eight meters in width, I could drop you down to five and a half, which is still very, very large. And I could go almost 20 meters tall. So there's some really interesting kind of size. That might be better if somebody wants to do some kind of variant of space football or some other kind of sport league in space to have a nice, large arena-like space. So Starship, um, we're excited about from a width perspective, but there's some other definitions of big and all of this next generation of launch vehicles should be um, worth watching to see interesting ways that you can maximize that payload space. Fantastic. I didn't put that together, the StarMax name. That's great. Uh, you've been doing some really cool pressure tests as well. Do you want to tell us how those are going? Yeah, absolutely. So we're hardware rich and wanted to get as quick as we could to the hardest problem. If you've ever accidentally left that Coca-Cola in the freezer too long, trying to get it just a little extra cold, usually if it pops, it pops at the top. And so that's very much true for us as well. All our uh, computer analysis says that where the highest pressures are, are in the domes. So we built eight meter domes as fast as we could and we put them together. So it has this really interesting look right now, of kind of like a metal macaroon uh, with just the top meter uh, uh, dome and, and the bottom dome connected together. Um, and the pressure that you're enjoying right now on Earth's surface, 14.6, 14.7 PSI, um, NASA tested their station to 22 PSI as the ISS was uh, getting ready to be built. We took ours to 26.6, which is way higher than the ISS tested. And what we basically said was, um, give me all the potential ways that you could accidentally add pressure or on purpose add pressure inside our modules and then have everything go wrong. OK, well, what if all the canisters for atmosphere were left on? OK, what could that do? What if all the vents designed to allow one way pressure release valves broke and were stuck closed? OK, what if all that happened during ascent when all the pressure was pushing on the bottom dome and beefing that up? We could not get above 26 PSI. And so basically concluded that if we could hit that, there's basically, we, we now have a pressure vessel that's ready for space. 
So we're so, I'm so proud of the team for how quickly we made it to that step and how much we kind of confirmed that, yeah, we're, we're ready for, for space manufacturing. That is awesome. What is the next step once you decided that this prototype is ready for moving along the TRL scale? Yep. How are you getting it to space? So the fun part is all the stuff that maybe isn't quite as amazing to look at in a YouTube video or a LinkedIn post, but that is happening in parallel. So we've taken all of our um, MMOD shielding, we call it space armor, um, to Texas A&M and put it through the hypervelocity, their hypervelocity cannon there. Um, they fire uh, half inch projectile, projectiles at 17,000 miles an hour. So that's seven kilometers a second. Um, that's orbital velocities. And if we were going to take a hit, can we um, ensure that uh, we're going to keep all the occupants safe? Um, and the answer is yes. So we've got these beautiful now, absolutely mangled pieces of art where there's this big hole in the front, this massive explosion, and nothing is making it through the back. So very pleased with, with that. Yes, we also have made similar milestones on the shielding side. Um, we've got our first thruster off the assembly line. Remember, if I'm going to leave a Starship or a New Glenn or a Vulcan and come and find you and dock to Laura Station, uh, I'm going to have to have my own thruster capabilities. And so we have a, a hot, hot, hot gas thruster, um, gaseous oxygen and gaseous methane uh, to um, uh, that's going to deliver uh, all the thrust we need uh, to be able to come do that. So we've got all that thrusting, uh, thruster testing coming up. So we've got a lot of different areas that are all making progress. What we're going to do next is bring everything together, um, practice some integration work, as you can imagine. Um, th that's equally as important as getting all the different um, players to act like a team. Uh, so that'll be big. And then it's leading up to uh, an orbital test in 2025, 2026. Uh, and we're all that early work uh, to be able to start building for, for orbit. That's fantastic. Looking forward to seeing all of these commercial space stations, LEO destinations come together. Does your technology integrate into any of those commercial space stations that have already been awarded contracts? We hope so. So um, obviously uh, lots of conversations going on. So there's, there's limits in what I can share publicly until um, everybody is ready to make those kind of announcements. Um, but in general, we're building to be compatible with an ecosystem. I really see myself as kind of the Boeing to other people's United and Deltas. So we see them as the operators. Um, you rarely see a, a Boeing plane. It's the Southwest logo on the tail, right? So um, we'll provide them with a core capability and then they will make it their own, maybe unique outfitting or unique use cases that they have for the inside. Uh, so from the outside, it might look very much like a Starmax, but when you come inside, there's a uniqueness that, oh, that's an Axiom station or that's a Northrop station. And we very much are excited about that, that kind of internal branding that still uh, will keep each of these different stations unique. That is pretty neat. I hadn't thought of it quite like that before, but it makes sense. Um, where, where do you envision this technology going? You talked about artificial yeah. gravity, spinning it up. So that's obviously not in the plans for these initial space stations that should be coming on board in the next few years. So when does that technology start getting tested, mm -hmm. especially in space? Because we haven't, there's been plans decades ago, but we haven't actually seen any kind of artificial yeah. gravity being tested in space to a scale. Let me pull it back a tiny bit and then I'll get to uh, artificial gravity. If I can genericize the question and ask, how do I kind of see commercial stations developing and kind of the future of space stations in general? Um, scalability is going to be huge. Obviously, I'm biased, but I, I don't expect anyone to, you know, if you look at Starship and, and their kind of claim of being able to eventually bring 100 people into orbit, no one is designing for uh, the ability to have 100 guests show up at their space station today all of these early destinations, they probably couldn't even accommodate 12, which sounds like some of the early goals that SpaceX has for the number of guests that they wanna put inside a Starship at one time. So there's a lot of work that we have to do to get a core capability, but if we can design this with a scalable modular field, we have a lot of ability to grow as demand requires. And I think that's what's gonna be key to make sure that these space stations cash flow and don't just have this huge cost up front but it takes decades before it pays off. Well, no, we can just add capacity as you need to add capacity with whether you're daisy chaining or again, all the capability we're excited to be able to provide people. Uh, uh, additionally, these stations are gonna be far safer. I mentioned before that uh, StarMax is the only place I, I would um, have my daughter visit space. Our radiation levels are half that of the ISS. And so 
largely that's driven by the fact that we can build with beefier materials because we're designing in the era of Starship, not for the era of the amazing but underpowered rockets of today. And so that will be a, a huge win for humanity that we can visit without putting our physical health at risk. Um, additionally, ISS is really stuck. They've got all of these needs to help groups go from pre-commercialization to commercialization or pre-productization to productization. And it's difficult to jump that chasm because so much of the work that goes into it requires an iteration rate that is just too high for the ISS to provide. They could do it in one of two ways. They could be providing, you know, I'll make up some extreme, a little bit hyperbolic, but, you know, daily trips up and down. That would do it. I try something. I put it in some goop or I freeze it, send it back down to earth to a well uh, kitted out lab. That lab evaluates that try, whatever it is we were trying. And then I get it back on the next flight up the next day. We do some more zero G stuff. And then we just stay in that, that process over and over again. The other way they could do it is if they had, could bring up more of that well kitted out lab in the first place. And again, I think here's a place where Gravitic shines. We can bring um, bulk cargo and bulk spaces to allow you to bring large amounts of that equipment on orbit in the first place. And if you're doing that, you're getting all of that capability where the iteration cycle never has to go back to the ground, never has to be frozen or in any way, other way, damage the sample in any way. You test, you, te you evaluate, you fix, you test and repeat. That gets us well, well past this multi-year waiting in line, do an experiment and then have to get at the back of the line and wait and wait. In Europe, it's, it's maybe a decade or more to be able to get to that scale. Um, and, in the uh, U.S., maybe it's a little bit shorter, but still problematic. I see a future where helping these firms do to the ability to fly larger, um, to get to productization, that is going to be critical, is being able to start producing on orbit these amazing promises we have for Earth, whether it's in pharmaceuticals or advanced material, materials, um, transistor chip development, all of these things have incredible potential of actually having enough value to be worth doing in space and then being able to sell to whether it's on orbit or more likely uh, awaiting public on the ground um, and really satisfying in a major need there. So that kind of future for space stations, even before we get to spin gravity, is going to be incredible. And I think it's very much within our grasp. The nice thing about that is, although NASA may spur that development, we hope that the commercial side so dwarfs what is possible with the um, with NASA, that soon NASA, it doesn't feel like they have to hold up each one of these space stations with, with their, their, um, their budgeted dollars. Just giving NASA far more flexibility in what they do. Um, okay, now to the spin gravity part. Um, as we get to that stage, we start asking fresh questions around, what if I want to stay longer term? These prices keep coming down. What if I wanted to stay permanently? I had some friends during the pandemic that um, were very first, uh, had, had a lot of foresight and they said, wait a minute, I am guessing there's going to be a lot of shutdowns here. Let's get on the last flight to Hawaii and we will do our lives from Hawaii. And that's exactly what they did. Zoom calls from Hawaii, horrible time zone differences, but he and his wife agreed that that works. They'd much rather have their feet in white sandy beaches and be okay with waking up at weird times to support the teams that were East Coast, West Coast, wherever they happen to be. Um, imagine that we can start doing that from space. Imagine that it's a legit option to say, I'm joining this conference call from low Earth orbit, um, whether I'm there for an extended vacation or whether I actually call space home. That is still a ways in the future. It will first start in much the same way the ISS did, where NASA will have an early interest and then it'll kind of expand from there. There's so much research we can do. Um, we need to understand um, even simple things like, will this piece of equipment work well under lunar gravity? Well, we can duplicate lunar gravity with the right spin levels. Um, how about Mars before we send a large number of settlers to the Martian surface with some of Elon's ambitions? Now this one gets a little more sensitive. Might we wanna be sure that we can bring a baby to full term and have that baby be healthy in Martian gravity before we dare commit a generation of um, citizen settlers uh, to the Martian surface without knowing that. Um, now I get it, that would be very challenging even to ask the question, but I think even more challenging to send them without knowing the answer. So there's a lot of things we need to know and an incredible potential that 
uh, spin gravity offers us for long-term settlement of space. And it asks, or it asks and perhaps answers a fresh question around, do I need a planetary surface in order to extend human flourishing through the solar system? What if instead I say, I can put one of these facilities wherever humanity has an interest. So the rings of Saturn, the moons of Jupiter, the clouds of Venus around the moon, wherever people are interested in aggregating, we could put a space that allowed them to flourish there with gravity. And the fun thing about star max is we're designing them to be compatible with that future. So starting in zero G, that's clearly where the business is. I started this whole conversation around the question, if we don't have a clear it works on the spreadsheet. I can make money on it today. I don't have a business and I'm not interested in just pretending in that kind of sci-fi future. But that doesn't stop me from saying that sci-fi future is a potential for us. We just need to build the roadmap to get there. I love it. I love sci-fi meets sci-reality, hopefully. I love it. That's a great term. I'm going to start using that. Some of this come to fruition. I really hope so. Um, yeah, Quinn, I'm not sure which which idea he was referring to because I only just saw the, the chat, but he says, I love that idea. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot resonating here with our crew who's all live watching right now. Um, people who are watching in the audience right now, if you have any questions, prepare them, either unmute yourself or ask them in the chat. Um, Quinn follows up with the one about bringing a kid into the world in Martian orbit in, or Martian gravity in orbit. Yeah, that is, I, I hadn't really considered that either. I, as a mother, I've considered how do you bring, um, you know, babies, how do you create families, do reproduction in space? But yeah, having that tested in orbit before you actually go is a great idea. Um, so yeah, anybody who has any questions, I'm going to ask one of more of you, Colin, and then open it up to the audience, which is, you talked about users. Um, how old is your daughter? Hi, uh, she's 12. She's 12, so I don't know yet if she's scientifically oriented, but you talked a lot about science and space, you know, the laboratories and all of that. But what about other people? What about other users? Where do you see those use cases being? You know, it's interesting as we started wrestling with it, the use case around uh, commercial LEO destinations um, bubbled up very early on. Oh, these guys are going to be the ones that own this. So let's provide um, capability to them. And that obviously is still a huge part of what we're doing. What surprised us is, um, the number of these space stations that really is saying, what I'd love to do is be a business park. And as people have cool ideas, they can come and bring their cool idea and connect it. Well, we make it possible for you to bring your cool idea and connect it. We're talking to customers that are excited about providing fresh uh, produce and plants in orbit. We're talking to groups that are excited about the potential for uh, and the need of, of data centers and compute capabilities in orbit. The, the number of different use cases is dramatic. And is launch can, as launch continues to come down, how exciting will it be to be able to take whatever your pearl is and I'll put it inside my clamshell and we'll take your pearl into space and be able to add to this business park or a series of business. And so I can't wait for users to think, oh, I have a cool idea, and no one has thought of it yet. And it's because we're, we're trying to be these healers. Uh, these right now, at the stuck in the locker on the island. They really have the potential to shine in a larger amount of volume um, to really be able to showcase some of what they'd be able to offer, some of which they would offer. Um, just to that community, some of which they would just leverage the infrastructure provided by the business park to provide to either the Earth's surface or, or to another. Um, but I can't wait for uh, Hilton to bring up their space hotel module. And uh, then we get the first Starbucks module plugging in. I can't wait for that kind of a future. And uh, I think we're definitely setting up Star Maxes to be that um, blank canvas for uh, the business of the future to really be able to say, oh, got it. So um, you're partnering with the groups that will provide me with all the power and communications and, and astronaut time I need. Yeah. And so you're going to give me a shell that gives me beautiful radiation protection and uh, all of the, the physical volume that I need to succeed. Yeah. OK, well, let's do this. What's holding us back? Nothing. And that, I think, is really the exciting part of uh, both the users we thought of, but also the, the on ramp for the users that we can't even imagine yet, but will be the ones that really change the world. Excellent. What's stopping us right now is money. <laughs> so yeah, sure. that always seems to be the limiting factor. Um, because you know, we can dream all the technology and all the use cases we want. If you were to go up, what would you be doing in the space station that you designed? Um, 
there absolutely would be uh, that part of it where looking out the, uh, the window at the Earth, I don't think I could help myself from that. I've talked to too many astronauts that have talked about almost life-changing kind of an experience the first time they've done that. Watching how the astronauts use their free time um, and how busy the cupola is, um, it doesn't feel like that gets old from the way that astronauts have described it, even those that have been there for extended stays. So I'm sure that I would be in much the same boat it would be my preferred TV channel every night. I know we'd be watching that. Um, beyond that, I'm excited to start exploring some other fun things like um, some of these sports that could be done in space and what we might be able to um, kind of experiment for, for later making bigger versions of that that uh, the people of Earth would be interested in. More than anything though, I'm so excited on this side of it. How can we make it so it's easier for everybody else to be able to go? You know, right now, it's still a really, you're talking about money. Um, we're still at the mega millionaire level. And some of these early changes drops it to low single digit millions um, of net worth to really be able to justify a trip like this. But there's not too many more drops as far as, and I can easily see that path on both the rocket side and our development side, where it becomes kind of, yes, it's still probably a trip of a lifetime kind of thing, um, but well within the, re the realm of you know, that 20 year anniversary trip that you take with your bride or something like that. So I'm um, excited about that cost curve and the way it has the potential to come down. Um, but there is definite work to do in that arena. You did bring up the concept of looking out the window. Does StarMax or any future prototype have the capability of being strong and radiation resistant while also having the large windows that we're seeing as a trend? Yeah, yeah. So uh, without a doubt, the answer is yes. Um, we would build the core units without it and then customize to each customer's preferences. The way to think about the way it'll probably develop is any kind of window, regardless of what you do, has not only potential challenges for can you hold the pressure correctly, but it becomes a target for uh, debris. So with the cupola, you see this kind of flower opening up and then they look out the windows and then the flower closes back over those windows when no one's there to prevent scratches and other dings that would impede the view um, for, for future um, astronauts. We would do something similar. So lots of coverings, you know, mechanical devices, shades that would come into place that would add that space armor we've been talking about over the glass when not in use. And then of course, open it up when, when uh, you wanna be able to take a look at your hometown kind of thing. We also could do things where the module itself stays without it for low cost production. And then we have specific cupola modules that are designed specifically for kind of that wow factor where you almost kind of immerse yourself in this, you know, 3D view of space. Um, that may actually be the more cost effective method, which is really interesting to start wrestling with. Well, yes, of course, engineering wise, I could do this, but let me ask a different question. Is they, there a more cost effective way to give you similar value that um, might allow you to either have it faster, better, cheaper kind of thing? Um, and that has been really fun in some of the conversations with customers is their openness to alternate ways of thinking. Quinn asks in the chat, does Gravitics itself as a business invest in any of these contexts for your habitats? Do you have people working on tech to support greenhouse hubs or hospital hub, or do you focus strictly on the core of business expecting the fill-in areas through partnership later? It's a great question. What I want to be careful of is not to accidentally step on the toes of a potential customer. Um, so if a customer is working in that space, we plan to support them in their work, being really careful. There might be a couple areas where, you know, that, that please don't, you know, hold me to that. There's a few areas where we do feel called to, now we should probably um, help in this area also. But for the most part, uh, a customer working in the area means we're going to back off we're gonna provide the core shell and allow their pearl to, to really shine. Um, and um, we win by them winning kind of a thing. Thank you, yes. Uh, Thomas asks, are there any major limitations to what could be done inside? For instance, an aquarium in a space hotel lobby would probably be tricky, right? That's a neat idea. <laughs> uh, actually, there's, I mean, you think like what's an aquarium, it's just, uh, we're just holding a liquid and we're having lots of conversations about propellant depots. So uh, as soon as you start thinking you could put air on the inside, well, we can do other uh, forms of interiors as well. So no, you're thinking right along the right lines. That is an interesting concept. It reminds me of like Star Trek and carrying whales. <laughs> right. I, I will say this though, that the, there's legit challenges that come with um, 
every time we add something, we're adding mass. We're adding power needs if somebody is doing something interesting inside. And of course, a lot of those productization things that the ISS is trying to get over the hump to be able to say, this is ready for making something in space. Um, a lot of them have far more power needs than, than what we've got the ability to do. But that aquarium idea, very cool, but attaching it to the space station would have some very significant challenges with how it orbits, how it station keeps. So it's, it's easy to accidentally think of us as the Lego brick that lets you do anything. There's still some challenges with orbital mechanics and a lot of other realities of space flight that have to be taken into account that kind of pull you back from the really cool maybes back to the, eh, maybe we ought to wait a little bit. Our thrusters yet aren't yet that good, or we would have to add too many either solar panels or radiators to be able to accommodate some of the, the use cases. So it's very much kind of a conversation, not just with what cool things we can think of, but what the operators actually have the capacity to be able to offer that we don't accidentally get ahead of their skis, right? Because we want to make sure that we're adding to their value, not giving them problems by demands that they can't accommodate yet in this kind of scaling process. Right. Allison asks, what happens if Starship is delayed or never comes to total fruition? Can you launch on smaller, can you launch in smaller components? We've intention, great question. We've intentionally designed our capability uh, to be diameter agnostic. So we're in, we know that people are going to want not everything's eight meters, right? I was describing that example with Vulcan, that five and a half, that we could go 20 meters tall. Um, but actually some of our first launches probably go on a Falcon 9, just because it fully divorces ourselves from our development to get to a first launch and the development of Starship. And who knows? Uh, we were so tickled pink with all of the work that they did this week. Um, four minutes of flight data, incredible, far better than I was thinking on, on mission one. I am just so excited um, for how that program is developing but they got a lot of work yet to do. And we've got time to wait so that they can. Um, but just the same, it gives us peace of mind to know that I can launch on today's rockets at certain sizes and with certain benefits, many of them being kind of confidence and being able to launch now. And then the new capabilities that come online, my ability to offer amazingness only grows as some of those new capabilities um, flourish. It's another good reason to pick diameters if you're trying to standardize that multiple next generation launch vehicles can accommodate. For example, if I go with something closer to six meters or six and change, um, I can accommodate both New Glenn and Starship. Now, you have to be a believer in both those vehicles, but that gives you an example of a way that you could design a common module, even if you did believe in the future and still give yourself launch vehicle redundancy. So customers are doing a lot of questions, right? Do you want six? But if you go just a little bigger and just totally commit to Starship, look at this amazingness. Ah, oh, but now I'm only beholden to Starship. Do I want to make that trade? It comes down to business. It comes down to what you really want to be able to offer and what trades you're willing to do to gain that added capability. Do you have any idea in your mind as to when we should see a fully operational Star uh, Star Max or any other prototype that you might come out in the future? Maybe maybe Star Max is strictly for here, and then you go to a different one. You don't really know how things are going to pan out, right. but do you have this timeline in your mind? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of the capabilities that NASA is looking for. So 2026, we get this kind of a big award of hey, these are the two to N number of commercial space stations that NASA commits to being on. They said, I need at least two. That's been true with COTS. That's been true with um, the uh, CRS program before that. Um, they, they want multiple providers. Makes sense. But they've also said before, we would love to have as many winners as, as seem legit, and we'd love to, to be on all of them. The more uh, competitive forces, the better. Um, that is a 2026 award. For probably a 2028, most of the space stations have been kind of leaning in that direction through public announcements of saying that's when a lot of them are wanting to be operational. Um, Axiom has notionally said that's when they're going to separate from the ISS is 2028. Um, you know, get, leave some room in case there's some issues. ISS, kind of that 2030 retirement age. So we got a lot of stuff coming along in these timelines. And these capabilities then going up about that time is probably also when you start seeing the capabilities of um, a full um, Star Max going into orbit. What you'll see far before that is some of our factory tours that will show full vehicles ready to go as soon as that customer wants it up there kind of a thing. So lots coming up as far as development wise. The fun thing though that surprised us a little bit was big pressurized spaces for humans, got it. That's where we started the company the number of people that have come to us and said, could I have a big pressurized space for a payload? 
And I said, hmm, interesting. Why don't you just want to use some existing bus and just plug your, your, your payload on that? Well, then I have to design for um, being outside and the challenges of vacuum. I've got to deal with all the radiation. If you're saying this is safer, could you just give me a magic bubble? And if it works in Denver, it works in space. So there's a lot of interest in us moving towards some of that capability as well. Those spaces tend to be smaller just from a need perspective. Most of these payloads don't need as much room as a human needs, which also gives us some flexibility to fly faster, fly sooner, because the existing launch vehicles are already good enough if I, if I shrink that down. So a lot of excitement from areas that we're, it's always a surprise when you do a startup, the stuff you know that's exciting, and then the customers knocking on your door, could you please help me with this? And uh, because that also needs the space armor, it also needs a pressure vessel, it also needs the thrusters, all those same things that we're bringing together right now, we could bring it together in a three meter size instead of an eight meter size and offer some capability to people. So um, we're excited to watch how that develops. You could probably see us putting some of those up there even before the largest star maxes, again, assuming some of these customers want to um, uh, take advantage of that form factor. That's kind of the advantage of us being flexible in that way. We can serve a lot of different in interests and needs. Very cool. We've got questions over here. Let's see. Um, Allison wants to know, how do we get one of those factory tours, which I assume is in the Denver area? Uh, let's see. I think the next options are, um, if you're going to ISS uh, R&D conference in July, we're going to try to uh, have some some opportunities there. So we'd love to have you up there. Nice. Otherwise, give us, give us a call and uh, we'll see if we can accommodate. Are you still doing that virtual reality tour? I know I saw oh, yeah. that in October. As a part of the tour, it's so ridiculous. It's just mind blowing how how real it all feels in there. Yeah. Yay for VR kind of helping us kind of, it even outpaces what I can build and my guys are building fast. That's awesome. Um, Quinn says, you mentioned having fabrication in space, but I think that was in the context of having a habitat that is a fab hab. Do you see the potential for building habitats themselves on orbit? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I love my investors and that they're never satisfied. When I first showed them the eight meter, they were blown away. They loved it. I showed them how you could scale it into multiple units and how that could provide, you know, Laura could have a unit, Quinn could have a unit, Thomas could have a unit, Allison could have a unit. Um, so you get both community spaces and privacy spaces. They loved all those concepts. Uh, and then the next day he calls me back and goes, um, I can't do a wedding reception inside your module. You need to make it bigger. And so um, there's two ways to make it bigger. I could go um, uh, even uh, right now, you look at like the life module that Sierra is doing, it's an inflatable unit. It ends up looking a similar size to ours, but it's intentionally small enough. Um, it's kind of like a Kevlar balloon, um, small enough that it could ride on an existing vehicle. Well, there's a way you could do an inflatable that you start with the only way it rides is in a Star Max or sorry, a Starship. And then after it deploys, it gets even bigger. So that's one way you could get bigger. The other way is to start looking like at Think Orbital and some of the other groups that are exploring ways to actually do on-orbit welding and actually start assembling these things in space to get, you know, the banquet halls, the, the, the wedding receptions in space. We can't wait for that kind of future. Again, one where we think that might be a half step too far. Love people that are starting to experiment in that. We're going to focus on the stuff we can build on the ground, make immaculate, amazing interiors for you, get you up to space, make use of that. But boy, I would love it if part we park it right next door to this monster space that's even bigger that absolutely can play Quidditch in space on your little um, air powered broom as you're zipping around or whatever you want to be doing. Um, I can't wait for those kind of volumes. I do see those probably in the 2030s before we get that far. Very cool. So um, Thomas has a similar question you probably already answered, but just in case you want to add more, he says the VR tour was so cool. And are there any serious considerations to going to larger than eight meters, um, launching on multiple rockets being put together in orbit? Excellent. Such a good question. Um, for now, the strategy would be we are exploring long term. Uh, so back up a little bit. The way you do connections in space, I talked about this kind of, hey, it's scalable. We can add multiple units. You know, it's just like we're building a Lego house one, one brick at a time. Um, the connection we're using is trying to be as compatible with current technology as possible. The two main strategy that most of, of Asia, Europe, and the U.S. uses is uh, an NDS, IDS clone and uh, a CBM technology. So uh, if you're doing docking, uh, that's like the slowest motion car crash in the world. You come in and click. That's all. That's what Dragon does. Any of the visiting vehicles, it's what Cygnus does. Um, it is controlled, but the, the thrust 
remains with the visiting vehicle and they're the ones that make the connection. With a CBM, the connection's a little bigger and so like 50 some inches, it's 70 some inches. Um, and that connection you get within a few centimeters and then uh, the robot arm for the station reaches out and makes the connection for you. Um, and so uh, there's variants on those and people are looking at clever other technologies, um, self birthing, that kind of thing. But generally those are the two kind of approved technologies. I say that to say, I've got this nice eight meter wide diameter if I fly on a star starship and it has to neck down to 50 some inches if I'm docking and 78 ish inches if I'm berthing. And wouldn't it be cool if the connector was actually at five meters, six meters, seven meters. Now there's far less necking down and I might get a longer space at eight meters um, over time, the, the guys at Vast, it looks like from some of their artwork is looking to do some similar things to that. So there's just a lot of interest out there in bigger space, in bigger spaces and bigger ways to make connections. And that might be a way to cheat before we're ready to build a larger pressure vessel with all the challenges that comes with that. Because you imagine we do on orbit welding, somebody still has to be the first person to go in and actually turn the ECLIS system on and actually breathe that air. And is it safe? we can do all that testing on the ground and be absolutely convinced that my daughter is going to thrive when she goes up there. I'm not yet ready to put her in something that um, we're, we're manufacturing up there, although that is the future and I can't wait for that. We, the only way will be multiplanetary is if we solve those problems, um, but we're going to walk before we run. And maybe in that in-between step, a larger docking or berthing strategy may allow us to leverage current modules but make it feel more like it's a bigger unified space if it doesn't have to neck down every time to 50 inches or 78 inches, but could stay larger at five plus meters. So definitely some strategies that allow us to explore the middle ground, but I can't wait for that future where we get really, really big spaces. I'm looking forward to the imagery that comes from those as well. Um, so Quinn Agreed. notes that you are in Seattle and he's in Washington and he asks, how have you been dealing with the engineer shortage in Western Washington? Yeah, so we are definitely a COVID company um, started with needing to be okay with remote work. We worked a lot of those strategies right away. And so we, we've got that down. If anything, we're working the opposite strategy. Now that we have a beautiful 40 plus thousand square foot space, and we'll be adding even more square footage uh, eventually in Florida as we, as we build out kind of close to the launch site. The question there is gonna be how we co-locate and get people kind of in that collaborative mode in person. So um, we've got two things in our favor. One, if I have to take a remote worker, it's still at least on the plate for potential. And two, we're just so darn cool we're getting an awful lot of interest where people are like, yeah, I could go take that job, but I, I want to go work for something that's really making a dent in the universe. And we're definitely on that cool side that are, is enabling us to attract that kind of excited talent where, you know, I, I did the X experience at the Fortune 500 aerospace and I kind of got fed up and uh, with trying to move the aircraft carrier and couldn't do it. This was the way they were going to go. And I had to just shut up in color and people can do that for a while, but for a subset of us, you get to a point you say, no, no, I need to do something with the time I have. And we're getting a lot of those people um, to apply. And uh, we have not had the problem of too few at, at, uh, applicants. If anything, we've had the uh, problem of too many. How, can I take you all? You know, it, it, we're getting some amazing humans. <laughs> that is amazing. And um, Quinn, I know his former Boeing and left for similar reasons. <laughs> so he can tell his own story. Um, he's asking if the big facilities in Washington um, yes, yeah, so uh, the big facilities um, in Washington, um, we're just north of Seattle, and um, we are uh, doing all our development there. All the early build work is happening there. Um, we are exploring, as I was mentioning, a facility in Florida that would put us closer to the launch pad. Once we start doing these at scale, um, we may need to um, build closer to where we're gonna launch. And if that's the case, then Florida might be a really great fit for us. And we may reimagine um, what happens in Florida, or sorry, in, in Washington, once we have the Florida facility up and running. But right now, all the adventures are happening in Washington. 
Very cool. I do have actually two last questions for you here. Do you have any advice for anybody who wants to work on uh, commercial space station technology, whether that's at Gravitics or another company? And two, do you have any advice for anyone who wants to become a customer, be on one of your uh, future space stations? Oh, I love it. Okay, uh, if you want to work in the industry, go be amazing first. So if I'm talking to a student, get the degree, push yourself, great experiences that come along with the formal classroom education. There's so many opportunities. We talked to, to people that were like, yes, yes, I did this in class, but look what I did on the side. And, it, and it's just amazing the opportunity for at least U.S. students. I can't speak to the international experience um, through university, but um, make the most of that. Uh, and um, two, um, be ready to work. Um, what I love about our team is how much they're willing to say the responsibility is mine. Um, so the kind of human I look for is this really, I, I, it's attention. I'm looking for an entrepreneur. I'm looking for someone that's their part, their life uh, experiences allow them to be a risk taker. Hey, when I was a new dad, I was not able to be a risk taker in that moment. So it's not a forever thing, but is your place right now in time something where you can be a risk taker that you're willing to kind of buck the trend? I did 20 years at Lockheed Martin. There was a comfort in working there. Um, Lockheed was going to be there week in and week out. There was no question about that. And because that, that, hey, that helped my wife sleep well at night knowing that. Um, so are you an entrepreneur? Are you ready to go against all of that? That tends to make you a loner. But then here's where the tension comes in. We are a giver culture at Gravitics. We are looking for humans that want to obviously be amazing in their field. That's why we hired you to do this job. Um, but if I see Laura banging her head against the door because it won't unlock and I've got the key, I'm going to reach across my swim lane to unlock that for her. That's what we need to be about. That is a group comfortable and eager for community and helping each other. So there's the tension. Am I a loner or am I working in community? I need both. And that actually will, we self-select out an awful lot of people that apply because it's hard to find that kind of a combo. Um, but if you are that kind of mix, we are eager for you to apply. Um, Gravitics.com, there's uh, uh, a whole careers page there and, and a lot of uh, recs. We even have an amazing rec there. Uh, so if you think you're amazing and we haven't put the rec out for your posi uh, particular position, don't wait, hit that rec. We'd love to hear from you. Okay, so Laura, the other side, for anybody wanting to go to space, um, Yes. So the easiest answer right now is to probably do it as a business owner. So find that amazing use case that those um, users of these business parks called commercial space stations are going to need. Come talk to us and we'll put you inside of StarMax and give you your own business that can plug right in and start providing value to that ecosystem. Um, but long term, it's not going to take very long as we keep dropping the cost of this. Right now, it's still a little bit like you're planning that amazing vacation that you've been saving up for for years and you're going to stay at the Ritz Carlton and it's a thousand dollars a night. But the Uber ride to get there was 10 grand. That's a little bit of the mismatch we still have in the ecosystem. And Star Mac, Starship especially has the potential of taking that Uber cost and dropping it to an appropriate level. And I'm definitely working on the Ritz Carlton pricing, getting those Starship uh, Star Max prices to actually be using these spaces on orbit, um, dropping those dramatically. We're going to need to work both in parallel, but the future looks bright for being able to actually be able to do this as a part of uh, uh, a legit opportunity for you in your lifetime. Fantastic. I look forward to that future as well. Quinn says, it sounds like there will be a persistent need for customization work to meet customer demands. And that sounds exciting. Absolutely. And some of it is stuff we're not going to do. You know, we're going to focus on the shells and there's going to be so much extra business that's going to come from people. Some probably that will custom, will be focused only on the customization process. How can I make this interior exactly what you need to meet your, your particular business needs? How exciting will it be where there's enough people surrounding the whole ecosystem where a Hilton or someone else that's super smart in their field, but isn't smart necessarily in space, that they have enough people to hold their hand through the whole process that I can give them uh, a Star Max and other people can come along with the necessary outfitting. And then Hilton adds their magic that what makes a Hilton experience special. And we put that in on orbit. And now people are actually enjoying, you know, um, uh, an amazing sweet experience over, you know, seven to 10 days kind of thing. Can't wait for that. And that's not that far off. 
I really hope not because I want that to be my future. I'm going to go out there as a scientist, but I also want to stay at like a, a Hilton's. <laughs> I love it. I love staying it. at a Starbucks someday. Colin, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for coming and speaking with us. It's been great. Oh, I've loved doing it. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks, everybody. These are great questions.